Welcome to episode 66 of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. We are slightly tardy. Uh, we are a little bit late. We're like an hour and a bit late off the schedule. The schedule is probably going to be uh, more of a guideline uh, from here on out. I think it's going to be more of a suggestion than some kind of reliable indicator of... Uh, time, uh, but that's all right, that's okay, I think, I think, and you know, besides, like a, like a, a Swift is never late, a Swift arrives precisely when he intends to arrive, wasn't Gandalf a wanker? Gandalf was always telling people off for not being as knowledgeable as he is, you fool of a took, Gandalf would say, as though he expected everybody else to be as clever as he is. Um, and so he's all, and you know, with, with the Palantir and stuff, he's always, it's, he always knows what's right, and everyone has to do what he says, but he's totally fallible. He messes up, like he gets, he gets himself balrogged before the end. And then he gets bloody resurrected, um, which is, which seems like cheating, doesn't it? He's so haughty, he's so arrogant, is Gandalf. Don't you think? I mean, he's not as bad as Saruman, I suppose, but for a good guy, he is a little bit of a prick. A wizened old prick, uh, but a bit of a prick, I think. Um, but today we are reading Aya 5, A Game of Thrones, the fifth Aya chapter, and indeed the final Aya chapter in this book. This is the chapter, indeed, Yoga, Yoga Dork. Is that your name, Yoga Dork? That is an amazing name. Oh, Voga Dork. All right, whatever. But this is Aya 5, uh, and this is indeed the chapter in which Ned gets beheaded. Uh, spoiler. Um, and we see Aya's point of view, Aya's time alone in King's Landing, trying to survive as a as a as a hobo on the on the in the capital, uh, which in itself could probably have been a whole book. Who wouldn't want to have read an entire book of Aya running around? Uh, attacking pigeons with a sword, uh, and sleeping with the uh, orphans, and uh, and just generally being a ruffian and a vagabond upon the streets. So that that'd be a good spin-off. Um, but we only get one chapter of that before we get Ned beheaded. Anyway, let's actually read the chapter, shall we? Let's get into it. Uh, so the chapter begins with the scent of hot bread. So we couldn't even go a full sentence before George Martin got a food description in there. Um, and uh, and she's on what's called the Street of Flour, which presumably is where all, like, the bakeries and stuff are. Um, uh, a lot of the streets in King's Landing are rather uncreatively named. Um, a lot of them, a lot of them are called like the Street of Flour, the Street of uh, of Pork Chops, the Street of of Hammers, the Street of whatever object is most prevalent in this particular street. Um, certain lack of creativity uh, in that part, I think. Um, but 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 they're all named by peasants. Maybe that's the issue. Uh, but anyway, Arya is really enjoying the smell of this hot bread. It is, it is sweeter than any perfume that Aya has ever smelled. Uh, of course, she being a bit of a pragmatist is probably more interested in practical bread than pointless perfume anyway. Um, but she's hanging out on the, on the street of flour and she's, and she's trying to catch a pigeon. So the pigeons in the street of flour, what with all the breadcrumbs everywhere, uh, they fatten the pigeon. So there are some particularly fat pigeons in this part of King's Landing, and so Arya is hunting one of these pigeons. Uh, so just when it starts to fly away from her, she uses her stick, her, her, her stick sword, uh, to smack it out of the air, like bloody Khal Drogo on one of his blood flies. He snatches it out of the air, uh, and, and grabs it. And when it pecks at her hand and tries to escape, she snaps its neck, and thinks with satisfaction that, man, catching pigeons is easier than catching cats. So, uh, so Aya has, has, has benefited and learned from her training. There are lots of examples where Aya is always thinking back to her training with Sirio Pharrell, uh, and how that training has helped her in her arc. Uh, and this is one such example. And then, <laughs> and then there's a Septon 
watching Arya Askins. So, so you know, so, so some septon, some holy man, some priest has been walking the streets going on about his ecclesiastical business when he sees some filthy street child who looks like a boy chasing pigeons with a stick and snapping their necks uh, to eat them. Uh, and that's and that's what the Septon witnesses. Which you know, surely, surely, if you have devoted your life to the to the spiritual, to the immaterial, to the transcendental, you've got to wonder. You know, there are street children eating pigeons on the streets. Maybe I should be more concerned about the material. Look at some of the shit that's happening on the material plane. Children starving so much that they need to catch and eat pigeons. Maybe my devotion to the to the transcendental uh, is misplaced, and maybe I should have more concern for the practical concerns of people who are starving to death in the city. But no, the Septon... The Septon looks at her, and Aya gives him some pigeon tips, and then and then he leaves. He hurries away, off to take refuge, in 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 whatever spiritual belief bombs his soul. Perhaps we're reading too much into it. Uh, so that's the first page. And by the way, there is this Reddit link on the first uh, bit of the description, uh, the description of the video. And if you would like, you can go and comment or ask questions on this uh, on this thread, and you can upvote and downvote the posts. And so whichever ones get upvoted most, we'll respond to during the stream. That's the idea. Uh, currently, we have uh, a, a, an individual by the name of CGM0 asking whether Dennis Malister and Ned Stark might be the same person. Um, interesting theory. Uh, not as likely, I'd say, uh, as the belief uh, that uh, that Ned Stark walks into a pigeon and then Aya cuts his head off. That seems most likely to me. Anyway, uh, so... Uh, the, the 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 priest hurries away from Aya. Aya puts the pigeon on her belt in the little pigeon holster that she's got ready on her belt. Uh, she's like Bat- Batman with with her utility belt with all the different functions. She's got a place for her lemon cakes. She's got a place for her sweet rolls, and she's got a place for her pigeons. A pigeon holster. So she puts a pigeon on her belt, and she walks down the street of flower, and she smells uh, that someone is selling tarts with blueberries and lemons and apricots, and she's desperately hungry, and so she asks the cartman for a tart. Um, because, of course, I uh, has grown up as a noble lady where you literally just ask people for shit and they give it to you, which is a pretty great arrangement, but she's not quite familiar with the whole sort of currency thing. Uh, she isn't quite familiar with having to pay in order to get what she wants. Um, and so this, this, this pushcart man tells her, well, you need to give me three coppers. This is how it works. Welcome to capitalism, mate. I need some coppers or you don't get tarts. It's as simple as that. Um, and I goes, aha, you speak of capitalism well. Well, sir, it's a lucky day for you because I happen to have on my person a fine, one-of-a-kind, luxury, uh, five-star energy-rated, uh, aerodynamic, extra features, well-feathered, luxurious, tasty, A-grade, Australian-made pigeon. I got me a pigeon, sir. I got a pigeon, and it can all be yours for the simple price of a tart. I will trade you this fat, juicy pigeon, high in protein, low in fat, for one of your tarts. This is a deal that you cannot walk past, sir. You cannot walk past. You will not regret your purchase of this pigeon for a tart. I is a real salesman. Saleswoman. Sales human. Uh, and the tart man says, uh, I appreciate your your energy. I appreciate your, uh, your salesmanship. But uh, I, I, I don't want a pigeon. I don't trade. In pigeons, sorry, mate, I don't, I don't do it. So I'm gonna hang on to this tart. So Aya says, "Fuck," and walks away. Well, actually, at first, Aya considers stealing one of the tarts. She's like, "I could, I could easily snatch it from this guy um, before he can chase me." Uh, she uses the the sight that Sirio has has always told her about, and she notices, uh, she notices that the cart man has a bit of a limp and he's a bit fat. So he probably wouldn't be very good at chasing Aya, but. 
uh, the cart man has a bit of uh, psychic powers and goes, well, if you're thinking of stealing my shit, uh, you're going to have to answer to the gold cloaks because there's a couple of the city watch uh, standing nearby. So I is concerned that if she steals the tarts, the gold cloaks might catch her. Of course, all she'd really have to do is uh, climb up a tower and then hide in a, in, a, in a little box of hay like in Assassin's Creed and then all of her notoriety stars her GTA stars would fade away and then she'd be fine, uh, but Arya clearly hasn't played uh, open world uh, RPGs before. <clears throat> so Arya decides not to steal the tart from the tart man. Uh, do you think that's what they call him, the tart man? It's like a really shitty superhero whose only ability is to generate uh, blueberry uh, blueberry and, um, and pastry at, at, at will. Actually, that sounds amazing probably the best superhero because the other thing is that you, you like the, the problem with superheroes is that with great power comes great responsibility like I mean, superheroes are always having their powers uh uh exploited and corrupted to do terrible things like superman keeps getting mind controlled and blowing up metropolis but uh it's hard to imagine the tart man's powers being used for evil isn't it I mean, it depends how many tarts he can generate. I mean, if he was able to generate so many tarts in one moment that he just cut, he just flooded the world and just choked the the ecosystem and filled the oceans and just towered the world with tarts, then I suppose we would have a problem. Anyway. Um, so, uh, Aya does not steal a tart, uh, she, uh, she instead leaves, and she thinks about what's going on politically in the city, so she's been hearing some rumours, and she's trying to suss out what's going on, um, so she's been staying away from the castle, she knows that the Lannisters were after her, from her last chapter, um, she doesn't really know what's going on, though, the gold cloaks seem to be on the side of the Lannisters, um, and some people are saying that her father, Ned, had killed King Robert. Other people said that uh, Renly killed the king. Uh, others, other people said that the king died while he was eating a boar. Uh, like, he ate so much, he got so fat that he just ruptured at the table. Um, as, though, as though he was attacked by the tart man. Death by tart, indeed. Um, perhaps, perhaps he'd ruptured from eating too much. Other people said that Varus the spider poisoned him, because of course everyone assumes that the spider is some evil, nasty, murderous, murderous urchin. Uh, murder rhymes with urchin, so, well, sort of, uh, which is how you know it's true. Um, uh, so there's all these different rumours going on, um... But everyone agrees that King Robert is dead because the bells at the Sept have been tolling all day and night. And the bells are like the flies in the last chapter. They are a dark omen. When, when you see them swarming, the bells or the flies, you know that death is afoot. And everyone recognizes the bells represent that King Robert is dead. And all that Arya wants is to go home. She wants to go back to Winterfell. She wants to be with her family. The last tart bender, indeed. Um... Uh, but, but all Arya wants to go, do is to go back home to Winterfell, uh, but she can't because all of the, all of the gates are closed. Um, the, all the gates have names, the seven gates of King's Landing, they're called the Dragon Gate, the Lion Gate, the Old Gate, the Mud Gate, the Gate of the Gods, King's Gate, Iron Gate, stuff like that. Um, and every day she checks all of these gates to see if she can find a way out of the city so that she can make her way back to Winterfell. Um, but they're all closed. The Lannisters are controlling everything, partly because the Lannisters desperately want to catch Arya, because she's such an important political asset uh, against the Starks. So the Lannisters really want to catch Arya, and Arya really doesn't want to get caught. Um, thank you for the donation, by the way, from Kevy Cool. Uh, we, will, we will respond to your message at the end of the episode. So Arya's like, all right, I can't get through the gates. Can't get over it, can't go, go under it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so maybe I should swim out the river. King's Landing has, that, has the black water, that big river that goes through the city. Maybe she could swim out the river, but she's heard that the river is very wicked and treacherous and it would be too dangerous to swim. Uh, she could try and get a boat out, but she has no money uh, to catch a boat. Um, maybe she could stow away on a boat, so she heads to the docks later on. Uh, but first... Uh, she had, she thinks about the pot shop, the pot shops. Um, so what she's been doing is she's been catching pigeons, uh, and then you can take them to this grungy ass place in the, in the, in Flea Bottom, which is like the poor side of town, where they have these pot shops. Pot, 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 why is that so hard to say? Pot shops. Pop shots. Shot pops. Pop shots. Pot shots. Pot, 
from having a stroke. Pot shops. Um, and what they have is these big old, big old cauldrons full of soup that have been bubbling away for days. And you just chuck shit in there and you take bowls out and, and the soup just perpetually, just perpetually does its thing. It soups eternal. The, the soup that soups eternal. It's like a religion, you know? All life sprung forth from the primordial soup millennia ago. And to the soup we return when we die. It's like a good sort of nature uh, religion, isn't it? But, I mean, if soup is your god, the, the question remains uh, who cooked the soup in the first place. you got one of those sort of cosmological problems, don't you? Uh, so, mm bit of a bit of a bit of a problem as a uh, religion uh but 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 uh, what i i would blah, 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 blah. what i can do is she can take a pigeon and she can take it to the pot shops and they will cook she can trade half of the pigeon uh, and they'll cook it up for her and she can also get a bowl of brown she can get some of the uh nasty ass soup that's been going for ages but she tries not to think about the meat that's inside the pot shop what kind of of meat is in here. Is it healthy? Aya is worried that she's getting sick from eating all these pigeons. Uh, because let's be honest, pigeons are probably not the healthiest diet. In the old food pyramid of recommended food groups, you know, with your grains and with your fishes and your proteins and your sugars and your carbohydrates, they uh, pigeon generally does not take up a very large area within the food pyramid. The food pyramid, which is, by the way, apparently bullshit, uh, apparently it was a bunch of a bunch of yanks uh, sat down and decided what the food pyramid is, what healthy eating was, but they were largely influenced by like um, economic interests, like American economic interests about what uh, what was considered uh, not healthy for you, but it was more about what what kind of food America wanted to sell the most of was actually the determinant of what's in the food pyramid today. That that food pyramid, which everyone uses around the world. Uh, was made up by a bunch of Americans who wanted to sell more dairy or something. Apparently, that's what I heard. Uh, call me wrong. Call me wrong if I'm wrong. Um, but apparently, the food pyramid's nuts. So hey, maybe the true food py- food pyramid. It's all pigeons and tarts. The only two food py- The only two food groups you need are pigeon and tart. Maybe pigeon tart. I've, have you ever tried pigeon tart? Could be amazing. Don't know. It's a mystery. Anyway, um, so she goes to the pot shop, and she she talking about the bowls of brown, um, but she doesn't like the pot shops, uh, because when she goes there, people stare at her. They notice that her boots and her cloak are really high quality, because, of course, Aya did get her clothes, uh, you know, as a, as a noble noble lady. She's got actual high-quality clothing, which makes her stand out, and it also makes people want to steal shit from her. Uh, so a couple of times people have chased her down alleyways uh, to, to steal her shit. And other times she's noticed people were not paying attention to her clothing, they were paying attention to what's under her clothing. Uh, and Aya doesn't know what they are thinking, but I think the implication uh, is something rapey. Because uh, when in doubt, uh, Game of Thrones tends to go for uh, the rapey option. Uh, so I think that's what that's implying. Uh, but uh, But yeah, there's a risk that people steal things from her. Uh, with, on her first night in King's Landing, uh, people stole her bundle of clothes uh, and uh, and stole some of the jewelry that she was hoping to sell. Stole a whole bunch of her, her whole bloody inventory uh, got taken uh, on her first night. The only thing that she got to keep was the clothes she was wearing uh, and needle uh, her her sword, which she was sleeping on top of to protect the most valuable thing she owns and a symbol a potent symbol throughout her arc of her original Stark identity. Uh, Perhaps let's take this moment to have a glance at the Reddit thread and see what the most voted comments and questions are. Uh, So, uh, not uh, not a lot of updating going on. Um, So, not super well to tell. Uh, But Mosa 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 uh, happens to point out uh, that the streets in King's Landing who are named like Flower and Steel and whatever, yeah, they're named after what they're most known for uh, because the peasants can't read. So street signs would do no good. They couldn't actually read them. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point, Mosa, 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 who, who I believe is um, uh, alias of Stephanie Morris, the inimitable. Um, 
because yeah, if you named one of the streets in King's Landing uh, the streets of 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 Crombopulon the first, who who I mean, you know, traditionally we name streets uh, in some parts of the world after famous people or whatever. So if you named a street in King's Landing, you know, Bobolophagos Street. Um, It'd be kind of pointless, wouldn't it? Because, yeah, no one can read, so the street signs won't do them good. Um, people wouldn't have an awareness of that being the real name of the street, so you'd end up just giving it, yeah, a descriptive name. It's the street with all the flour in it because of the bakeries, so you call it the street of flour. Maybe the street of flour does have an official name that's different to the to the local name, um, but it's not used. So, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mosa, 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 Mosa. Uh, and Caleb asks... Um, uh, Caleb asks why the Northern Mountain Clans call Ned the Ned when he should be called the Stark. Uh, that's a good point. My guess, uh, because of course, to clarify, the the Mountain Clansmen call people like, uh, the leader of the Nori, they call the Nori, and the leader of the Wool, they call the Wool. Uh, so the leader of House Stark, they should call the Stark, but they call Ned the Ned. I think the reason they call Ned the Ned, uh, is because the Ned is probably the coolest sounding nickname uh, ever. The only thing better would be the Ned that rides, um, but, um, but, but, but we know that Ned shouldn't ride very much because he tends to have horses land on him. Uh, but anyway, thank you for those Reddit comments. Uh, so Aya has had a bunch of stuff stolen from her, um, and, um, and she's trying to take measures to protect herself. She avoids going to the pot shop alone, um, and she, and she, is keeping her weapon on her. She's keeping needle on her. Uh, she uh, and she's concealing the blade. She's doing some concealed carry. It's like Texas up in this shit. Uh, she's got weapons on her that no one can see because she doesn't want people to try and steal needle from her, and she doesn't want to uh, attract unwanted attention. But she does need to defend herself. Um, if only those school teachers had needle. If only those school teachers had a weapon, they would have been able to stop the school shooter, if only they had Needle. Um, but some of these people at the pot shops don't look uh, deterred by weaponry or by whatever Arya does. Some of the people at these pot shops are fucking nasty, grungy people with nothing to lose. Uh, they wouldn't be scared of her if she had a battle axe. Um, so uh, she's worried about them. So Arya's in danger, Arya's hungry, Arya's scavenging to survive, it's a difficult time, and thank you for the donation from Aguilar8325. Um, so she thinks, all right, but once I get outside King's Landing, it'll be fine. Once I break out into the open world, it'll be golden, because I'll pick some berries, I'll raid some orchards for apples and cherries, it'll be delicious, I'll just, it'll just be all fruit. It'll just be, it'll just be so nutritious, it'll be like a smoothie, it'll just be, a, my whole life will just be a continuous smoothie river. I'll get all of, all of those superfoods, you know, all the cranberries, all the fucking, all the chia seeds, I'll get all that's tasty, wrap it up into, bam, delicious. Um, but, to do that she needs to get out of the city, and she's unable to get out of the city so far. Um, and then... She sees a bunch of kids running by, and they're chasing a rolling hoop. Remember when that was a thing? Before the Super Nintendos, and before the Ataris, and before the board games, people, children, had hoops. Literal wooden hoops that you would, like, chase around the street. Um, because that was the best form of ent entertainment we had at the time. They were like the fidget spinners of the 1860s. Me and my mates would always chase our hoops down uh, down the main cobblestones in London town, um, you know, knocking over all of the bespectacled Scrooge types uh, as you'd go and chase your hoop. And it was a great time. Um, some folks tried to introduce a new toy. They replaced the hoop uh, with, instead of like a circle, they had a sort of a square, and it didn't roll as well. It didn't roll very well at all, but all of the all of the fancy... All of the fancy bourgeoisie types had their bourgeoisie square hoops and tried to tried to make us circular hoop fe people feel in inferior, but um, they were wrong. Who needs HBO when you've got a hoop? Indeed. Um, so I uh, uh, sees all these children running by, uh, and she and she feels resentment towards the children. Why should they get to have fun with hoops while I starve with pigeons? 
uh, Aya thinks. And she thinks of how she used to play. Uh, she used to play with Rickon and Bran and John with hoops uh, when she was safe in Winterfell. She would have given anything for John to be there. She misses. Uh, she misses John desperately. Um, but, um, but she doesn't get to be with her family. Um, she, yeah, she, she wishes that John would muss her hair specifically. She, she's always, uh, it's always John mussing her hair that she remembers, but she thinks now, uh, that her hair could probably not get any more must. She's been living rough. She hasn't had access to a brush. So her, so her hair has already achieved like a maximum mussage, uh, full mussage achieved, 100% optimum mussage, uh, max mussage, uh, Arya's hair has achieved. It is a mess. She's like bloody, uh, who's that, who's, what is it, Bellatrix? Who's, who's the actress who plays Bellatrix in Harry Potter, who ev- every one of her roles, she just has like this gigantic crazy bird's nest of her hair. She's in all of the, um, uh, what's his name? You know, the, the bloke who does this, the, the spooky skeletons movies? You know, Edward Scissorhands, you know that? You, you know who I'm talking about. The, 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 the Bellatrix actress, she's always good uh, with some, with some must hair. That's, that's what Aya looks like right now. Um, and so I, uh, tried to make friends with some of these kids. She recounts trying to connect with some of them in the hope of, you know, getting a place to sleep out of it. Uh, but they tend to stay away from her. Uh, and some of them have actually attacked her. Some children, some, some of the other street children have knocked her down and tried to steal her boots. And yeah, Tim Burton, that was who I was thinking of. Um, yeah, Helena Bonham Carter is the name of the actress. She's always got great hair. Yeah, she was married to Tim Burton, apparently. There you go. Um, incredible. Um, so, uh, and so kids have, like, treated Aya badly, unfortunately. Um, uh, and, and Aya's not quite sure why she, none of them have been nice to her. Maybe they're all a bit more suspicious. I mean, Aya's used to, like, highborn ladies, uh, who are all taught to be nice to each other and courteous and help each other out. Um, but the street kids perhaps have more to lose, uh, by giving each other, looking after each other, helping each other has a cost. Uh, and perhaps they also recognize Aya as someone who's highborn and someone who's different and therefore someone who it's best not to tangle with. Because if anything's going to reduce your life expectancy as a common person in Westeros, uh, it is uh, fraternizing with the highborn. You like to get your bits chopped off, as Masha had all learned at the Inn at the Crossroads. Um, so she thinks uh, the ocean. Maybe the ocean is my way out of the city. Maybe I could stow away on a boat. So she decides to go to the riverfront, to the docks. Uh, and she notices that the docks are quite quiet when she gets there. There aren't many ships around. There isn't much going on. It's kind of weird. Uh, and then she notices at the end of one of the piers, there are guardsmen wearing grey woolen cloaks trimmed with white satin. Stark guardsmen, it looks like. Um, so I was like, holy shit, th- this is th- these are the people who were meant to take me... To Winterfell, because remember how Ned was originally planning for Arya and Sansa to get on a boat called the called the Wind Witch to go back to Winterfell because King's Landing was too dangerous. Arya assumed that, that that ship had sailed, but she comes here to the docks, and the boat's still here. So she's like, "Holy shit, this is my chance to come home!" And so she runs up to the guardsman and she's like crying at how happy she is that she that this looks like her ticket back to Winterfell. And for a moment, she has hope, but then she goes, "Shit, actually." Something's wrong here. Um, so, so she looks with her eyes. She hears Sirio whisper, and she recognizes that this is a tarp. It's it's an Akbar. We got a we got a Code One Akbarino going on here because these are not father's men. They're dressed like Stark guardsmen, uh, but they are not truly Stark guardsmen. These are strangers. She doesn't recognize them, so she's like, "Shit, this ain't right." So she wants to run away, but they've already seen her. These Stark-looking guardsmen have seen her. Um, so she's like, shit, I, I shouldn't run away because that'll be suspicious. I'll just walk up slowly and try to sell them a pigeon. <laughs> uh, so Aya's really using her bartering sales, salesman skills here. She's really doubling down on the old, hey, you want a pigeon? I've got a fat pigeon, super tasty pigeon in my hand. Do you want a pigeon? It's really tasty. I'm going to put it in, I'll, in a... Fuck, I couldn't find a rhyme. Uh, but she tries to sell a pigeon. 
Um, and the guardsmen are like, uh, no, <laughs> no, we don't want a pigeon very much at all. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and also the guardsmen recognize her as a boy, not as a girl, uh, because she's, uh, just so filthy, um, and, uh, and wearing leathers and not all dressed up like a lady. So they, so they, they, she, they think she's a boy. Um, and, um, and so she leaves. Uh, so she manages to get away from the guardsmen. So it looks as though the Lannisters have set a trap. The Lannisters have tried to draw Arya to those guardsmen by dressing them up as Starks, uh, which is quite a clever ploy, isn't it? Um, to try and draw Arya. Um, but, but alas, uh, Arya slipped through the net. Um, so she goes back to Flea Bottom, uh, and uh, she decides to go to the pot shops to sell her pigeon to get some food. Um, and, um, and problem is her pigeon gets stolen. She doesn't, she doesn't know if she dropped it or if it fell off her utility belt, her pigeon holster, or if someone like pickpocketed her, it from her, pickpocketed pigeon, say that 10 times real fast. Um, and then she's like, shit, she feels defeated because she's lost her pigeon. And so she's so hungry, but she has no prospect of getting any food. So she's like, shit. And then the bells begin to ring. Um... So everyone's like, holy shit, what does this mean? The bells are ringing. Has, has another king died? Like, what the fuck's going on? What do the bells mean? So all the chatter on the streets among the pe- peasants are all like, it, has the new king died? Is Joffrey dead? Um, and then someone else is like, nah, that, that's not a dead king bell. That's a summoning bell. I know my bells. Uh, and that's, that's a different bell. They're just, this is just to say that something's going on. Um, it's, it's not a dead king. Um, and then everyone's like moving up towards Visenya's hill. Everyone's heading up towards the sept and everyone's going, and so I was like, what, what's going on? What's happening? What, what's, what's, what's the deal? And she hears that the hand, she hears that, um, the, the hand of the King Ned Stark is at the sept of Baylor and shit's going down there. So I was like, oh, holy crap, I got to go find out what's going on. Um, and for some reason there's a peasant called Boo. There's a, there's a peasant with, by the name B-U-U. What the fuck sort of name is that? It's like some Dragon Ball Z shit. Boo. What sort of name is Boo? George R. R. Martin is so weird with some of with some of his names. He's got all the Johns and the Roberts, and then every now and then he he just throws a boo in there just to throw you off. He's he's funny with his naming of things, isn't he, George? Uh, but anyway, everyone's heading towards the Sept, and then Arya trips in all of the commotion and all of the crowds, Arya trips in a rut in the street, and she falls, and she scrapes her knee open and smashes her fingers, and... and half of her thumbnail gets torn off, which is very fucking painful uh, for those who haven't had a fingernail torn off. Um, and her knee is also very bloody. Uh, we, we, we had our fingernails torn off all the time when we were playing with hoops back in London, Derry. I lost so many fingernails that they started call me, calling me Fingernail Joe uh, for my lack thereof. It was an ironic nickname, you see, Cockney slang. They called me Fingernail Joe for my complete absence of fingernails. I was the clumsiest hoop boy on the block. I was renowned for how bad I was at hoops. Every time I'd try and chase the hoop, I'd get confused. I'd run towards some other circular object. There was a man called Moon... 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 Moon-faced... Moon-faced... Jimmery. And whenever I saw him, I thought he was the hoop when I was playing hoops. I ran towards him. I ran away from my own hoop. I got mixed up. My legs got tangled. I fell over. All my fingernails got torn out again. It was a nightmare. It was like a strike. It was like a bowling pins. That's how my fingernails just leapt out of my body. It was a fucking nightmare. So they called me Fingernail Joe. Back in the 1830s in London town. It's true. Um, so they move towards the Sept of Baylor. Uh, and along the way, uh, after Aya falls over, uh, she sees the Red Wine Twins riding by. There's Sir, Sir Hobber and Sir Horus Redwine, uh, who, uh, used to be called Sir Horror and Sir Slobber by Sansa and Jane Poole. Uh, and they always used to laugh when they saw them, but now, uh, the Red Wine Twins do not look so funny. So it's funny how context changes things, isn't it? In the context of, uh, when you're comfortable and when you're happy and when you're safe, um, 
it can be fun to have a good time and joke and make fun of things. But when you're starving and chasing pigeons and your fucking fingernails are getting ripped out, uh, things tend not to not be so funny. Playing at hoops uh, inspires only resentment, and Sir Horror and Sir Slobber inspire only anxiety. This is a dark time. Um, and uh, there's a stream of people heading towards the Sept of Baylor, and apparently Lord Eddard Stark, the King's Hand, is being taken to the Sept, uh, and people are betting that uh, Eddard is going to be executed. Uh, everyone thinks Ned is a traitor, and they think they're going to chop his head off. So these guys have clearly been reading ahead. They know the spoilers. Um, and someone else points out, yeah, but they're not going to cut off his head on the Sept of Baylor, are they? So that introduces another issue, which is the fact that the Sept of Baylor is a holy place. It's like the Vatican of Westeros. And it's generally not considered kosher to execute traitors in this holy place. Um, it's like going to a, to, a, to a church or a mosque or a... What's the Jewish one? Shit, what's the Jewish one? What's the Jewish... Place of synagogue. It's like it's like going to one of those holy places and just cutting people's bits off. Um, in most religions, generally considered uncool, unless you worship the old gods. In which case, uh, executing people in front of the trees, in front of the holy place, is in fact encouraged as a sacrifice to the old gods. In fact, a lot of religions, including those before mentioned uh, Abrahamic ones, uh, all have their own special history with human sacrifice. So perhaps. Perhaps that doesn't bear comparison, but the point is that it's generally not considered cool uh, to go killing uh, killing people at a holy place of worship. Um, yeah. Uh, and so they talk about what the fuck's going on. Some people think that Ned killed King Robert. Some people think that Renly killed Robert. Uh, but another person defends Renly, saying, no, Renly's a true fine man. He wouldn't kill his brother. Uh, so that sort of alludes to the popularity uh, of Renly. A lot of people like Renly, and that's part of why Renly thought he could be king. He figured if a lot of people like him, he can just run for president, get elected, win the primaries, it's going to be great. But in Westeros, you need more than popularity. You ideally also need real political legitimacy, uh, unlike in the real world sometimes. <coughs> <coughs> uh, so they're going up the Street of Sisters towards the Sept of Baylor, and... Uh, and they go into the plaza in front of the Great Sept of Baylor. It's white marble, uh, and it looks... It sounds quite impressive uh, and rich-looking in the, in the books, though in the show it looked quite simple indeed. We didn't even really get a glimpse of the Sept itself, really. Um, uh, so they head up to the Sept, uh, and there's a huge crowd, and it's this, the crowd is so thick and big that Aya can't actually see what's going on at the Sept. So she climbs up to the statue of Baylor the Blessed, one of the old uh, Targaryen kings, um, and, and she climbs on top of his statue in order to see above the crowd and to see what's going on at the Sept. Um, and, and since her fingernail is broken, uh, she leaves smears of blood on the painted marble. Which, by the way, you would think would be pretty magically potent, wouldn't you? Because, like, we just saw a blood magic ritual in Daenerys' chapter. It was, it was blood plus sacred jujus equals seriously intense magical shit going on, right? That's the usual formula for magic in this world. In this case, Arya's putting blood on a statue of a holy Septon king. You would think that that would have magical power, right? Or is the faith of the seven not as potent as the old gods and or or, or the law or, or 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 whatever other kind of godly powers Miri Mazdur was invoking in the Daenerys chapter? It's hard to say. The other interesting thing is that the statue is painted. It's mentioned, and that's one and that's one of those interesting little 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 factorinos, because uh, apparently all those like old Roman statues that you see, all in the Louvre and whatever, um, you know how they're always just like the bare stone. Apparently back in the day, a lot of those like Roman statues and shit, they were painted, like colored, um, so you could see, uh, you, you, you could see like the details and the clothing and the faces and the eyes of these statues all picked out in different colors, and it looked very, very different to what we often imagine uh, those old places looking like historically, which is really interesting. Um, but, but, but yeah, normally depicted without the color. Anyway, um, so Aya stands on the statue and she looks out of the Sept of Baylor and tries to work out what's going on, um, and, and she sees her father. There's a whole crowd of knights and lords and important people, and there's also Nedard Stark. Uh, and Nedard is looking unwell, uh, even, even worse than, Ned, than uh, Aya is looking. He's wearing nice clothes, 
the Lannisters have dressed him up in rich clothes to make him look like he's okay, but he's very thin and he's and he's in pain because of his leg and he's being held up more than he's being more than he's standing. So he's really uh, not very well. Uh, and the High Septon is there, the fat High Septon, the first High Septon who later gets um, killed in the riots and then replaced by another Septon who gets killed by Cersei, who gets replaced by the High Sparrow. Um, but but the High Septon is there. Uh, and he's wearing his crown of spun gold and crystal um, uh, that wreaths his head in rainbows. Um, uh, because rainbows are a symbol of the faith of the seven. Um, and Joffrey is there wearing a golden crown. The Queen Mother is there. Uh, the Hound uh, is there with a snowy white cloak. Varus is there. Uh, and a short man with a silvery cape who we recognize as Littlefinger is there. Uh, and Sansa is there, and Aya, Aya scowls when she sees Sansa and thinks, why is she looking so bloody happy? Uh, so Aya's always annoyed when she feels that Sansa isn't exhibiting the correct amount of stark loyalty. Um, uh, so that's an issue. Oh, and Janos Slint is apparently also there, wearing some elaborate armor to show off his new status as a lord. Um, and Aya's feeling very defensive of her father. Janos Slint pokes Ned and Aya... Aya thinks, you leave him alone. So she's trying to defend her father, uh, and she, she does more very soon. But, uh, but Ned steps forth and says, I confess my treason to the city. I confess plotting to betray King Robert, um, which we know he's innocent of. But the reason Ned is doing this is because he was told that he needs to confess, otherwise Sansa will not be safe. And also, if he confesses, he'll be left alive. He'll be allowed to join the Night's Watch. Um, but Ned describes how supposedly uh, he betrayed Robert, uh, and he and he and he uh, and he and he uh, plotted to kill uh, and depose King Joffrey, and Ned wanted the throne for himself. And of course, the truth is so completely different. Um, Ned Ned wanted nothing less than to have the throne, uh, but. Uh, that is what he has to confess. And he says that Joffrey is the rightful king. Um, and a stone comes sailing out of the crowd. People throw rocks at Ned, just like how people were trying to stone Daenerys in the last chapter. People try to stone Ned for his crimes, uh, and blood runs down his face. Um, and, uh, and as soon as people start throwing rocks, the king's guard smartly uh, step in front of Joffrey to protect him. Step in front of Joffrey and the queen, which you'd think is the first thing you would do as soon as people start throwing things, is protecting the important people. Um, but 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 people don't always do that. You ever see the movie Snowpiercer? It's it's a pretty good movie called called Snowpiercer, where everyone lives in a, on a train and it's all dystopian and shit. Uh, and and in that movie. Uh, spoiler, but, well, not much of a spoiler, minor spoiler for Snowpiercer, but, um, at one point, someone throws a boot at a lady, uh, and it's like, okay, people throwing things, great, maybe you should be more careful about that in the future, but then, not much later in the movie, someone throws an axe at the same lady, and it's like, okay, well, why did you give an opportunity that time? Because it's a similar scenario to what's happening in Game of Thrones here. There's like a crowd, and there's like a bunch of people who are talking to the crowd. Um, you would think that given that someone had just thrown a, a boot recently at this lady, the next time you'd give a speech, you'd have people standing in front of the lady, you know? But no, she's left wide open, and someone throws an axe at her. And then, later in the movie, someone throws a knife at her. But three times they throw things at the lady, and none of the times does the government, does the people, the, the bad guys, decide, hey, maybe we should protect this lady who people keep throwing things at. Uh, that, that's not a spoiler. People throw things at people. That's fine. Um, but it's a good movie, and you should watch it. Uh, anyway, but, but the moral of the story is, if people throw things at you, pr protect your neck, son. Protect yourself. Christ. Anyway, uh, so so people are chucking things. Um, Ned's com confessing, and Aya prays. Aya says, "Please, gods, keep Ned safe. Keep my father safe. Don't let them hurt him." So again, you would think that there's some kind of magical flimflam going on. She's put the blood on the statue of the Holy King. She's praying to the gods. I mean, she's probably praying more to the old gods. Uh, but 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 come on, like she's in a sacred place, making a blood sacrifice, praying for her father to be safe. Uh, and apparently nothing happens, so magic uh, certainly is, uh, 
a bit bullshit sometimes in Game of Thrones. And anyway, the High Septon steps forward and says, as we sin, so do we suffer. Uh, and he says that, well, the gods are just and they punish people who sin, but at the same time, the gods are merciful. So, yo, King Joffrey, the most reliable political authority in the land, who, what is going to happen to Ned? What's your decision? What should we do with this traitor, Ned Stark? And Joffrey says, well... Cersei and Sansa uh, asked for mercy and for Ned to be sent to the wall, uh, but uh, I, I've, I've just had a look over my script again at my liner notes, and apparently I, Joffrey, am uh, a despicable, a despicable, um, just, 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 just butt, butt face all over the butt, um, and I'm actually going to choose to kill Ned, actually, is what I'm going to do, Joffrey says. Uh, and so he says, so Ilan Payne, bring me his head, mate. And so Ilan does. Uh, so Ilan picks up ice, Ned Stunk's Valyrian steel sword, and approaches Ned to cut off his head. And everyone immediately freaks out, by the way. As soon as Joffrey says we're going to cut off Ned's head, everyone freaks out. The High Septon goes to the king and says, yo, this is probably a terrible idea. Varys comes rushing over, waving his arms, saying, this is a terrible idea. And of course, you've got to wonder what Varys's plan was, of course, because uh, Varys always has some ulterior motive going on. And we know that Varys has a habit of stealing characters and taking them onto his cause. So like Barristan Selmy, uh, when he was kicked out of King's Landing, Varys uh, directed him to hang out with Daenerys Targaryen and support Varys's cause. Um, and uh, similar stuff happens with a bunch of other characters. So I wonder if uh, Ned was going to be taken over to Varys' side somehow. If Ned got sent up to the wall, maybe Ned would mysteriously vanish on the way to the Night's Watch and would then suddenly be found in bloody Essos helping out Daenerys. Wouldn't that be a weird twist of events if Ned got, got used by Varys for some purpose? Um, maybe not helping Danny directly like that, but I'm sure Varys could find uh, a good purpose to use Ned for. Um, and yes, yeah, Sansa's freaking out, Sansa's falling to her knees and sobbing hysterically because everything Sansa did, she did in the hope that it's all going to be okay as long as Ned, uh, as long as Ned confesses, everything's going to be okay, but everything suddenly is not okay. And Arya, in response. In contrast to Sansa, who just starts crying at the bad news, Aya immediately tries to take action. Aya, Aya decides to do something about this problem, so she throws herself into the crowd, and she draws her sword needle, and she starts trying to fight her way to Ned to protect him. And she slashes at people in the crowd who are in her way, like she probably quite seriously injures, or maybe even kills, we don't know. She really hurts some people, fighting her way through the crowd um, to try to get to Ned. Um, and she, yeah, she's hacking at people, kicking at shins, like wildly fighting her way through. Uh, but Ilan is drawing ice, Ned's old Valyrian steel sword, trying to... Try, uh, and he's about to cut off Ned's head. Uh, but then, while I is fighting through, someone grabs her. Uh, a hand grasps Ned, uh, grasps Aya's arm like a wolf trap, and she drops a needle, uh, and a face goes up to hers and says, Don't look! And this is Yorin, by the way. He says, Don't look! Uh, and Aya struggles and tries to get out, and she's sobbing and she's freaking out, uh, but, but, but Yorin says, Close your eyes, boy! Uh, and, and there's a sound. There's a sound that sounds like a million people let out their breath at once. There's a sound while Ned Stark's head gets removed from his body. The protagonist of Game of Thrones, of the first book of Game of Thrones, arguably gets killed. The man who tried to do the right thing. The man who was honest. The man who was honorable. The man who we all rooted for, who we wanted to succeed, dies here towards the end of this first book. And Yorin tries to tell Aya not to look. Uh, so Yorin seems to be acting not only in interests of Aya's safety, but also in terms of her emotional well-being. He's not only uh, taking her under his wing to protect her, but he's also telling her don't look, uh, because he figures she'd be freaked out if she saw her dad getting executed in front of her. Um, so Yorin, Yorin's rather a sensitive, compassionate foul fellow, it should be said. Even if he looks and smells unpleasant, uh, he cares about Aya's well-being. But, yes, Ripperino Nedarino, uh, Sean Bean has been killed again. Ding dong, the Sean is dead. 
Um, and so Arya recognizes Yoren, uh, and Yoren says, all right, you're coming with me. You're a boy now, and you're coming with me. We're not going to talk about what just happened with Ned. We're going to leave. We're going to be pragmatic, uh, and, and, and we're going to, it's all going to be, we, we, we've got to be smart, and it's going to be okay. Um, although Arya, of course, doesn't really know what the fuck is going on. She's in a bit of an emotional state right now, and she doesn't really understand what's happening. Um, but she does recognize that Yoren pulls out a knife, and the blade flashes towards Aya's face. And Aya throws herself around and tries to wrench herself backwards, but, but Yoren's got her by the hair, and the knife is moving towards her body. And then the chapter ends. So George R. R. Martin does a, a, a pretty mean cliffhanger, uh, I would say. Um, c- kind of a gratuitous cliffhanger. I mean, we're all still reeling from the death of Ned, and for a moment, I think, people are thinking, shit... Is Arya going to die as well? There's a knife flashing before her face. Is Yoren killing Arya? Is that what's going on? Um, of course, it's not what's going on. What's actually going on is that Yoren is just cutting Arya's hair to make her less recognizable and to protect her better. But George R. R. Martin chooses to end this chapter simply with a knife flashing towards Arya's face. So that uh, that is definitely an indication. Um, definitely, uh, definitely an indication that George R. R. Martin enjoys fucking with his audience. Um... But yeah, that was a pretty fucking significant chapter. We'll have a look at uh, the top comments on the Reddit thread to see uh, if people have some things to see. Um, Top posts. Um, Wheaties1235 asks, Do you think Yoren is saving her because because she's kin to Benjen, or does he have some deeper motive? The Night's Watch takes no part. Well, yeah, that's a good point. The Night's Watch is meant to be politically neutral. The Night's Watch is meant to not interfere in whatever the lords and the, and the politics are doing. Uh, but here, Yorin chooses to protect Arya Stark. So, yeah, that is not strictly in keeping uh, with, um, with the Night's Watch's supposed ideals. Um, is, she, is he saving her because she's kin to Benjen? Well, yeah, I think Yorin seems to have some loyalty to the Starks. I mean, he not only would know Benjen Stark, but he also uh, was chatting with Ned Stark, and, and Ned was was good enough to offer men to the Night's Watch and stuff. So, um, so it could partly be that ne- that Yorin respects Ned Stark uh, and protects Arya uh, partly out of respect for Ned. Uh, but the Starks have always been seen as allies of the Night's Watch. Uh, so I don't think it's I don't think it's unusual for the Night's Watch to be uh, sneakily sort of on the side on the side of the Starks here and there, given that the Starks always were patrons of the Night's Watch. Um, so yeah, I think that does make sense. Um, Brandon Winslow asks if anyone if anyone's arc if anyone's road uh, is more harsh and difficult than Arya's is. Um, and yeah, Brandon suggests maybe Theon maybe Theon has a rougher time than Arya does. Um, but, but at least that was kind of his own fault to some extent by betraying the Starks and all that. Whereas I is just this little nine-year-old girl, uh, she does really nothing wrong and yet she constantly suffers and constantly has a bad time. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think, um, Alt has a, has a Aya video that sort of explores that. It is really fucked up what Aya has to go through and I think it's one of the most um, emotionally impactful arcs is Arya. There's a lot of fucking pathos in spades uh, in that particular arc. In terms of non-POV characters, though, I reckon Jane Poole uh, is definitely a contender for one of the characters who suffers the most blamelessly, because Jane Poole also uh, uh, does absolutely nothing wrong, and she suffers in so many ways. She's forced, uh, she's sold into one of Littlefinger's brothels, and then she's married to Ramsay Bolton, who abuses her horrifically, makes her uh, perform sec- sex acts on dogs, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and then Jane Poole has to go out into the cold, and she loses part of her face to frostbite, so really fucked up stuff happens to Jane Poole. Uh, so yeah, she's definitely up there in terms of the most um, suffering characters. Um uh, Mosa 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 points out that the folks, the, the foe, not folks, the foe Stark soldiers by the boat uh, mistake Aya for a boy. Could that be a bit of foreshadowing given that Aya is about to start pretending to be a boy? Um, I don't know if that's strictly true because Aya is repeatedly mistaken for a boy. 
Um, like even earlier than this, people sometimes call her a boy. Like remember uh, the gold cloaks uh, when I uh, snuck out of the sewer after seeing the dragon skulls in the red, red keep basement, she was mistaken for a boy as well then. So I don't think it's necessarily uh, foreshadowing her taking on the disguise of a boy later on. I think it's just that Aya tends to look like a boy uh, when she's not dressed up properly. So I think that's just more just a character of... Um, uh, what she looks like. Uh, Kerry Noir asks, do you think Thoros could have reattached Ned's head and brought him back to life? God, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't suppose why not. Uh, because, I mean, if you can resurrect Beric after him, you know, getting lances through the face and cut open in a million different ways, um, then it, it doesn't seem as though you really need organs in order to be uh, resurrected. Uh, by uh, R'hllor, by the Red uh, Priests. Um, so I don't see why not. I mean, you know, and and Kyburn. Kyburn apparently resurrects uh, Gregor Clegane as Robert Strong uh, and apparently doesn't even need Gregor's skull in order to do that. I mean, that is contested. There are lots of different opinions about um, how that all works. Uh, but it seems as though Gregor Clegane's skull is given to the Dornish uh, in, in, in the books. Um, and yet, Robert Strong is walking around, which begs the question, what head does he have? Does he have a head? Does he have a skull? Was the skull fake, or it has, does he have someone else's head? There are all these ridiculous theories that Joffrey Baratheon's head is on Robert Strong's shoulders, or Rob Stark's head or something, all sorts of crazy theories. But if Robert Strong can walk around w- without a skull, then why can't Ned's head get reattached? Um, the, someone raises in the comments... Uh, that indeed uh, the bodies are preferably fresh in order for the resurrection to work. Because we have Thoros talking about how the resurrection of Catelyn as Stoneheart was inadvisable because of how old and gross the corpse was. Um, So yeah, you'd want to get to him soon. But maybe they could have resurrected Ned if they got onto him fresh. I mean, frankly, the whole mechanic of resurrection... I think is overused by George Martin uh, because it, it leads to all of these sorts of questions where it's just like, well, you know, any important character dying, can't you just reverse it through a resurrection? And I feel like that does take some of the dramatic weight um, out of out of death. Uh, so anyway, yeah, all right. Thanks for all those questions and comments on the Reddit thread. Uh, I think this system actually might work, guys. I think this might be a good system. Um, if you all put good comments and questions in the Reddit thread and then we can upvote them, then we have, like, the, the most interesting questions to respond to there. So instead of getting constantly distracted by trying to follow comments in the in the chat, I can just have a look at the Reddit. Uh, but we also will have a look at, um, at all of the comments and questions from people who kindly donated. Um, so Aguilar8325... Uh, sends a donation from the happiest country in the world in 2016. What was that country? Uh, Let's look it up real quick. What was the happiest country in the world in 2016? Uh, There are a bunch of different organizations and different metrics that measure this stuff. Um, Apparently the 2017 happiest country was Norway. Uh, but what was the 2016 one? There are, there are a couple of different measures of this, so that it might sort of depend who you ask. Uh, but uh, 2017 was 2016. 2016. Uh, I can't see it on the Wikipedia page. Maybe someone can say in the chat. What was the 2016 happiest country? I can't see it there. Uh, but maybe it was one of those um, northern European ones. Those are pretty happy places. A lot of the time you hear. Uh, but thank you for your donation, Aguilar. And Just In Time uh, says, You're awesome. Also, what does Sansa mean in the trailer when she says, uh, The wolf dies, but the pack survives? Who is the lone wolf? Uh, well, we talk about that in... Old Chief Dex talks about that in one of uh, those uh, trailer breakdown videos. But the whole wolf dies, pack survives thing, uh, it's something that Ned tells uh, Arya in the books. And I think what it basically means is, like, stark solidarity. I don't think it's... I don't think there is a specific lone wolf and a specific pack. Um, but it's generally about the idea that in order to survive in dangerous situations, you've got to stick together. You've got to work together. You've got to uh, stick close with your family. Um, because if you if you betray your family, if you split off from your family, if you try to go it alone, you will die. Uh, and that is probably a very poor omen for, Sa- for Arya, isn't it? Because Arya spends so much of her arc alone. Uh, I, think, I think Arya will probably die 
uh, just quietly. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the wolf dies, but the pack survives. That, that's talking about the importance of sticking together with your family. And that's part of the reason why I think Sansa uh, will not betray John and her family for Littlefinger. I think Sansa will, um, will stay on their side. And I think Littlefinger is toast. Um, all right. I think that concludes this episode, the 66th. 66th uh, episode. Oh, while we're here, though, yeah, so we have one commenter. Oh, sorry, I can't read your names very easily right now. Uh, but Rasheen Rue asks, how do you measure happiness? Lol. Um, which which is a good question. It is very difficult to ask happiness, uh, 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 to measure happiness. I believe the way that they do it in all of these surveys and these rankings is they literally just ask people. They just ask you how happy you are. And there are a lot of very legitimate questions that can be raised about their methodology, right? Like, are people... Um, accurate, ac- uh, will people accurately report their happiness? Um, and aren't there lots of biases in how people will will report on that? Um, and, and wouldn't there also be language things and cultural things? Um, there are, I mean, surely different cultures express and understand happiness in different ways. So, like, does it really make any sense to just, like, get, like, a raw number to, to compare against one another? Like, yeah, I think there's a lot of good questions to ask about those happiness metrics. Um, but, it's 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 interesting to measure um yeah it, it's a separate thing to hdi which is also an important thing um anyway but yeah i think this concludes this uh this episode so thank you to everyone who commented in the reddit thread i think we'll continue using that system in the future thank you to everyone who donated to the stream uh that's always appreciated uh and uh everybody have a lovely week cheers